have access to the. Oh, thank you. Um, will have access to the resources and opportunities that they need to thrive in a comprehensive and equitable system of care. We serve a wide cross-sector audience, including everyone from state leaders to providers to school workforce, infant and early childhood mental uh, providers, community-based providers, peer supervisors, family partners, youth partners, and much, much more. Uh, our services range from individual consultation, as you can see from this uh, wheel on the, on the slides here, um, to more in-depth sessions like the one that we're offering today. Um, our aim is to really create those outlets for communication, collaboration, and resource sharing amongst all of us. Please also make sure to check out all of the resources and archived presentations on our website or go to contact us link and their request consultation or training. The, uh, that link and all of that information will be provided in a, a slide at the end of our presentation today. So you'll be able to get that information. Next slide, please. So look for the follow-up email after today's um, session. We want to um, make sure that you know that you can uh, get a certificate of completion. These are commonly asked questions that we get at most of our presentations. Um, all you have to do is um, email Joanne Bloom at jbloom, the address right there, uh, to report your participation. And uh, you can get a copy of this presentation that, was, that we'll be showing today. And you can also get a copy of the recording if there are parts of this that you missed or will need to miss throughout this uh, presentation. Um, next slide, please. So again, welcome to today's session. We're talking about siblings. Unique concerns, unique opportunities, and effective strategies. We're so lucky to have with us today um, Emily Hall, and I'm going to let her introduce herself a little bit more, but I have a, a particular affinity to the Sibling Support Project because we had it in Utah for many, many years and found it to be a very um, a, a really good opportunity to reach out to young people who have siblings who have been identified um, in our area was with uh, mental health and behavioral health um, disorders. And it was a great way for those siblings to find out that they're not alone in this world, that the other siblings are dealing with this too. So I'm excited to hear really great things today from Emily, who is in charge of that, that project now. Um, next slide. And I just said everything I wanted to say for that slide. So um, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. This, uh, the next slide just talks a little bit about what the agenda is and what we're gonna discuss today. And I'm going to transition this right over to you, Emily. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Lori. Thank you to NTAC and Fred Love for creating the space for all of us to come together today to talk about siblings and learn more about siblings. Um, I really hope that today is an engaging and interactive experience. I hope that my own voice is not the only one that I hear over the next um, 90 or so minutes. Uh, so we're gonna um, jump right in and we've already done our welcome. I hope all of you feel welcomed. Um, we are going to tell you a little bit about uh, the Sibling Support Project, which is the organization that I represent. Um, we'll talk about our commitment to equity and inclusion, which is really the cornerstone of all of our work. We are going to talk not only about um, how we support siblings at the Sibling Support Project, but why. And in that discussion, we will cover um, or maybe uncover some unique concerns and unique opportunities that siblings experience 
as well as um, I do want to leave you with some really, I think, simple everyday strategies that you can use, that you can um, encourage the parents you work with to use to support siblings in their lives each and every day. So these are really easy, simple, everyday strategies that, that we can all uh, use moving forward. Um, and then Lori's gonna uh, close it out with some new information about um, next steps for the family exchange. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with me or the Sibling Support Project, uh, I will tell you that my professional background is as a social worker. I um, worked for many years at a large disability service provider in New York City, and there I was really lucky to be able to start to learn more about um, the work of Don Meyer, the founder of the Sibling Support Project, and contribute to some of the books that he was working on. Um, I also um, really only the, the true reason for this slide is um, it's a shameless excuse to be able to show you a picture of myself and my brother, because I think that my greatest qualification for this job is that I am also a sibling. And there you see a picture of me and Peter. He's my older brother. He's two years older than I am. He has uh, developmental disabilities. And this was a great picture um, of a wonderful memory that we shared in 2010. So this was a few years ago. I like to tease my brother that that was a few years and a few pounds and a few wrinkles ago for both of us. But we were so lucky to be able to go to the White House for the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. They did a really lovely ceremony and um, Peter and I were able to attend. So I was very grateful that he was there with me. And, you know, in general, I would tell you that Peter really is at the center of many of my personal and professional decisions. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to him because he's the reason I'm here with all of you today. So just don't tell him that because his ego is very healthy. Um, okay, so about the Sibling Support Project, we are the first national organization in the United States dedicated entirely to supporting siblings of people with developmental health and mental health concerns in inclusive and culturally responsive ways. So when I talk about the work that we do, I will sometimes use as a shortcut the word disabilities, but please know that we really do support siblings um, of people with a variety of developmental health and mental health concerns. Um, we are a proud program of Kindering, which is Washington State's largest neurodevelopmental center, and we're located right outside of Seattle, Washington, where it's actually very sunny here today. So for those of you who think it only rains in Seattle, I promise we do have sun sometimes. As I said earlier, the cornerstone of our work is really a commitment to equity and inclusion. And that really begins with the statement, I belong. We want every sibling and all the people who are out there supporting siblings to feel truly welcome to bring their entire selves to this space and to feel a sense of belonging. Uh, we understand that truly equitable and inclusive support for siblings really requires an understanding, not only understanding of, but a dismantling of systemic and personal oppression that maintains the status of people and groups who have historically held power. And that really means understanding our own identities, our own privileges and biases, and ways that we intentionally or maybe unintentionally oppress others who are different from us. Um, we do this by striving to meet every sibling we encounter with an open heart and an open mind and to really check ourselves, right? Check ourselves often and honestly to consider how our identities and actions affect the people we wish to support. Sometimes it's that difference between intent, right, and impact um, that a lot of us are familiar with. So what exactly do we do with the Sibling Support Project? Well, our work falls into two categories, education and support. Uh, we have a number of books that are written not only for siblings, but by siblings. We're very proud of that, to have sibling voices in, in, uh, on the pages of our books. We also, um, we talk to the media every chance we get. You can come to our website and look at our news blog and see some recent um, opportunities we've had to promote awareness through the media. We also provide direct support through these amazing things called Sib Shops that I'll tell you just a little bit about um, on the next slide. Um, 
We offer a number of lectures and workshops and conference presentations. Um, future planning uh, is a workshop that we just started offering to siblings and their entire families. Um, because future planning is something that um, can often present a lot of obstacles for families, as many of you actually probably know, either from your own families or working with families, and we want to make that process easier um, for siblings, adult siblings, for their parents, for the individual with a disability, and that really starts with the entire family getting together and talking about what is so difficult sometimes to talk about, um, which is a time when things will be different and maybe some of us will no longer be here. Um, so we want to provide that support in a really nurturing and um, uh, positive uh, environment. And then last but not least, we do offer online communities for siblings of different ages. SibNet is our largest and longest standing group for adult siblings. Sib teen is obviously for adolescent siblings, and then Sib 20 is for sibs in their 20s. Um, and we have these three different age groups because the issues that impact siblings might impact siblings kind of in different ways at different times of their lives. Um, so these three communities are completely free to join. Uh, there are closed groups that are monitored by myself and an admin team, and they are wonderfully warm and supportive spaces where, um, again, siblings can receive 24-7 peer support. I mentioned sib shops just a moment ago. I am so excited. I was so excited for this presentation because I know that all of you are from different states, and um, we have trained organizations across the entire United States and in about 20 other countries around the world on how to run sib shops because we know that they are such important supports for school age siblings. Um, sib shops were created with the idea of providing the same kind of common sense peer support that parents get from a good parent to parent program like Fredla, uh, maybe a good parent support group, um, but they're created for kids, right? So they look a little bit different. The, um, the basic recipe for a sib shop is information and peer support in a highly recreational setting. So sib shops are opportunities for school-age children, so ages 8 to 13 pretty much, although that that age group is really expanding as more organizations are offering sib shops. Uh, eight to 13 opportunities for kids to get together, meet other siblings, maybe for the first time, realize they're not alone. They're not the only kiddo who has a brother or sister with fill in the blank. Um, to uh, play games and have a lot of fun because after all, we're working with kids. So we are unapologetically playful in sib shops. We want kids to come and have such a great time that they'll be pining to come back for the next one. So information, um, lots of fun and peer support, right? We know that um, in every great sib shop, there are adult facilitators there who understand that we're not the experts in the room, that these kids are really the experts of their experience, and they have a lot of wisdom and knowledge to share with each other. Um, and so that is a lot of what happens in sib shops. Uh, I'd love to show you just a really short video that introduces the sibling support project, the work we do, and it will give you a little sense of what sib shops are all about as well. And Lori, I can still see you. I'm gonna make sure that you can hear the music um, by giving me a thumbs up on the next slide. At the Sibling Support Project, we believe that every sibling deserves to have access to information and support that empower them to care not only for their families, but also for themselves. The first time I had really the privilege of co-facilitating a sib shop, I thought back to my own childhood and thought about how lucky I would have been to have had the opportunity to meet other brothers and sisters of kids with disabilities. I marveled at the opportunity that these kids had to meet each other, to talk about the ups and downs of having a sibling who is considered to be different by, by society. Sib Chops got their start in 1982. We had an, an immodest goal of making Sib Chops as available as parent-to-parent -parent programs are for parents. And with 550 Sib Chops in almost 20 countries, I think we're doing a pretty good job of that. 
The secret sauce of Sib Shops is information and support in a highly recreational setting. Play does a remarkable job of bringing kids together. When it's time to sit down and talk, they're more likely to want to talk because all these barriers have been broken down with the playful activities they've been engaging in. There's an unspoken connection that you see on their faces, that you hear in their stories, and you see them nodding and acknowledging each other's experiences, and that that really is the greatest joy of the work that we do. If we support young SIBs, validate them, inform them, heck, celebrate them, we increase the chances that they will elect to remain lovingly involved in the lives of their brothers and sisters when their parents no longer can. Siblings really are the next generation of caregivers. They say it takes a village, and when it comes to supporting a person with a disability, that's really very true. All right, so that is a little bit about us uh, and how we support siblings, but let's take a step back and talk about why it's important to support siblings. I will tell you that a big part of my job at the Sibling Support Project is really advocating for siblings and um, helping parents and service providers and members of the general community gain an understanding of what sibling experiences can be like and why it's important to support siblings. I think many of you will agree that if we look at our fields, our respective fields, and we look at the family support services that are available, when we think about family support, right, the traditional definition of family is really about parents, isn't it? When we think about our family support programs, we're really talking about supporting parents. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is help providers and um, families even and, and other community members understand that when we are defining family supports and family support services, we want to make sure that siblings are really included in that definition of family, right? Because as it turns out, siblings play important roles in their families and in their communities. Um, and when we think about why it's important to support them, I often share with people the following five points. First of all, that siblings experiences parallel parents' experiences. We know from the research that pretty much anything that we can say about being the parent of a child with support needs, we can put ditto marks on for siblings, okay? Um, siblings experience many if not most of the same issues as parents as long as well as some unique experiences of their own that we're going to talk about today as a group sibling issues are lifespan issues so when you think about it these brothers and sisters will be in the lives of the person with the disability longer than anyone longer definitely than any of us service providers right and probably in many cases longer even than parents. This is a relationship that can easily exceed 65, 70, 75 years, okay, which is a long time. Um, so sibling issues or lifespan issues, siblings who are preschoolers will experience some unique concerns. Uh, siblings who are senior citizens will experience some unique concerns. And those concerns and experiences will really evolve and change over the course of the lifespan of the individual and the family. Siblings also spend quantity time. What do I mean by quantity time? Well, if you look over the course of the lifespan, it turns out that siblings spend a, a great deal of time together. They have a high level of involvement with one another, particularly in the early stages of life and then again towards the later stages of life. Okay, we know this from the research, not just about siblings of people with disabilities, but siblings in general, okay? Siblings also spend quality time. And by this, I mean that, first of all, I'm a big fan of inclusion and inclusive classrooms if they are supported correctly, right? I don't know that anyone's really figured out what that magical formula looks like. But as, as much of a fan as I am of inclusive classrooms, I will tell you that no classmate 
in an inclusive classroom will have as great an impact on the social development of a child with a disability as their siblings. Okay, siblings are 24 seven social models. And then last but not least, the last reason we should be considering siblings and thinking about why it's important to support them is that siblings really are the next generation of caregivers, right? This is something that certainly families are discovering, right? As parents are, um, you know, now recognizing that, that their adult children are living longer than ever and routinely outliving them. Um, as parents age and, and become less able to care for their adult children with disabilities, what we're seeing is that siblings really are stepping in to that caregiving role. Um, so families are recognizing this. You service providers out there, I think you'd agree that you're seeing this. Uh, even government is recognizing this and starting to think about ways that we can strengthen what they call natural supports, meaning family members like siblings. So these five reasons, I think, make a complete a pretty compelling argument as to why we should be thinking about siblings and supporting them at every turn. Okay, now for the dreaded breakout session. No, I hope it's not a dreaded breakout session. I hope you look at this as an opportunity to connect with some of your fellow, um, fellow meeting participants here and to think about and talk about some unique concerns that siblings exp experience excuse me, so in your groups, and everyone is free to turn on your cameras. In fact, we hope you do. Otherwise, your, your meeting, uh, meeting participants will be looking at a little blank screen. Um, so I want you to get together. I think, Lori, we have 12 minutes in the breakout rooms. Is that right? And you're yes. going to try to identify at least five, five unique concerns so challenges, um, things that you think siblings may struggle with as a result of having a sibling with a disability, okay? Please try to um, elect someone in your group or maybe somebody will volunteer, some brave soul, to um, take notes and then come back to our big group here and share what you guys talked about in our larger group. Does that make sense? Yes, okay, good, I'm seeing nods, great. Uh, I think, Ashley, are you... Um, working on breakout groups. Yep, I'm ready to send folks to breakout groups. Let's do it. We'll see you guys back here in 12 minutes. All righty. And if you haven't joined a group, Ashley should have invited you and make sure you click the button that says join. So make sure you click on the button that says join to join your group. And I think, Ashley, I think there's a way you can move people into those groups. I think if you cl click on the breakout group, I'm not, I've, I've done it as a host. I think if you um, open the breakout rooms and click on the person's name, I think there's a way to send send to the group, maybe. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I um it's so for the folks who are still in the in this space, like I know Angela says she can't make it because she's on the phone. Um I'm not sure, Jessica, are you here? Are, are you experiencing any issues? Because um, it, it won't allow me to move them. Except yeah, I see. in between different rooms. I see Angela's driving. Yeah. So. 
Um, do you, if you want to, do you want to make me a co-host and I'll see if I can. Um, I don't see any out. buttons on here where it says to move them. Okay. Um, I can move them in between other rooms, but I can't move them out of this space. They have to accept the invite. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we have one person just joining us. I can move Kimberly. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, do you want to let the two new people kind of know what, what's happening in the breakout rooms? Sure, so for Kim, Kimberly and Turkesha, I, I'm sorry if I, was I close? Turkesha? Turkesha? Was I close? It's Turkesha. Oh, darn it. Okay, Turkesha. Um, welcome. Um, we have just gone into breakout rooms, um, and the groups are talking about trying to identify five challenges or concerns you think siblings experience as a result of having a sibling with a disability. Hey, um, Tarkisha and Kimberly, I'm going to move you to breakout rooms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Hello, if you're just now joining, um, we are in breakout rooms right now. So, not sure, family. Yep, I'm here. So for Shannon and Sonia and Nikki, who just joined, we are in great breakout rooms right now, breakout groups. Um, so Ashley will move you guys into breakout groups and in those groups we're talking about uh, we're asking all the groups to identify some concerns that you think concerns or challenges that you think siblings experience as a result of having a brother or sister with a disability. Okay. Okay, so for Wanda who just joined and um, Nikki, I think you came out, but now are back in. We are in breakout groups discussing challenges that you think siblings experience as a result of having a sibling with a disability. Okay. So if you're able, Ashley will move you into a breakout group so you can have a few minutes left with, with the group. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Brittany, are you just joining us? No. Were you in a breakout group, but you bounced out? My 
computer, I couldn't hear you guys on my computer. So I switched it over to my phone and then my phone wouldn't let me use the microphone to participate <laughs> in the breakout group. Uh-uh. So I finally got it to figure out how to use the microphone. Hence the reason I'm speaking to you now. And it like cut me off from the breakout <laughs> group. Uh-oh. <laughs> so um, I think Ashley struggling. can get you back in there. <laughs> okay. That'd be great. Really? Thanks. Do you remember the names of maybe like one or two people who were in the group with you? No, but I think it was number seven. Okay. All right. Well, let's try. Okay. All righty. Welcome back. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Okay, we have Actually, about, how much time do we have left on the breakout rooms? Yeah, we have about two minutes left. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is it possible to send a message to let them know they've got two minutes left? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. This is Angela. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Welcome. Hi. Sorry, it's I really wanted to attend this training and unfortunately I'm going I'm going between courthouses right now. So I apologize for not being able to participate as much as I would like to. So because it's a really, you know, I would have liked to participate in the discussion. Oh, no worries. <laughs> it's like right up my alley. Oh, good. Well, you know, Angela, so. this will be obviously um, it's being recorded so you can watch it later when you have a little bit more bandwidth and um yeah hopefully this is just sort of the the springboard to more activities that we can do in collaboration um, to support siblings so hopefully this is just the starting point awesome yes uh i my son's i have a or had a a son with disabilities actually two and then i have two that are typical so i i know all about siblings with with that experienced siblings with disabilities. So it's uh, it's definitely a challenging road for them. For sure. And as a mom, you could probably um, teach most of this. So um, we look forward to you just chiming in whenever you can, as you can, however you can. And uh, if not, hopefully this is just validating to listen to and hear everyone's experiences. Absolutely, yeah. Looking at it now that my sons are, my older sons are adults and seeing how it has affected them as adults, it's really interesting to, you know, see how, how it's a long-term effect. Uh, Emily, you're on mute. Oh, welcome back everyone. I was saying we have our overachievers who have returned early. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, please feel free to turn your camera on so that we can talk to faces rather than just blank screens. Thank you for those of you who do have your cameras on. Um, first of all, question just by, a, I'm sure your reactions will answer this question. Do you feel that you had enough time in the breakout groups? Yes. Yes. All right. There you go, Lori. We were we were debating. Um, when I do this breakout during uh, the training, the Sib Shop facilitator training, I give a lot less time and people are usually a little upset about that. But have you ever been in a breakout group for too long? Yeah. It's it really weird. awkward, right? <laughs> it's really weird. It's like you talk about what you're supposed to talk about and then you cover the weather and then it's sort of awkward. So and where do you live today. and where do you live? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like all we right. Could talk about this a long time, though. It is a big subject. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you for saying that. Yes, it is Absolutely. a big subject, and yep. um, yes, we were. We would love to hear from all of our groups. I don't know who would like to begin. I don't know if you remember what group number you were in. Oh, Patricia, a brave soul. Yes, we'd love to hear from you. What did you and your group talk about? So we were in group one, breakout room one. And um, yeah, the, the, the concerns are 
are many. So uh, one of them was that it was the pressure to step up and, and the, for the sibling to have that pressure to step up and not being able to fully enjoy their childhood experiences because they're looking out for their sibling or something. Um, a, another one was the judgment from other peers. You know, what does your peers think about your disabled brother or sister or, you know? Uh, we talked about even the finances that once some of these children are, are like parentified by the time they're teenagers, right? Because they don't have the opportunity to fully experience a childhood because they have a disabled sibling. And so they always looking out, but how do we keep this unit together after the, the, the parents are gone? You know, finances, what if they have to, to move into a home? Uh, all those things probably is quite concerning for, for youth or young adult. Then we talked about the emotional piece about it because they have mixed emotions and they don't want you to do or say anything to their siblings, but they don't always want the responsibility of having to protect them and raise them. And, and so um, how do we help them manage some of these emotions? Because some of them could be quite angry, right? So we, we had a discussion around that. And what I found that was interesting that uh, one of my colleagues said was, what will my future look like? When I go off or move out of the house, what does that look like? When I get married, am I expected to bring my sibling along? When I have children, how does that interaction play in? You know, so I, they're thinking about this stuff all the time, all the time. And then the last one we, we had um, was resentments for having to take on the responsibility either now or in the future, but it's going to have that, that part will come only because that that's the way we are as humans. And then we start to resent. And so how do you keep that relationship um, even, respectful? Um, so yeah, we had a nice conversation in, um, in breakout session one. Sounds like a great one, yes. Thank you so much, Patricia and group number one. You all covered so many of the topics that are really um, important to, to dive into. Um, first of all, that pressure, right, to achieve, to sort of be the good kid, to um, in, in some ways almost maybe even make up for the limitations or the perceived limitations of the sibling with a disability. Um, there was a researcher a number of years ago named Sharon Colbin who did a study on um, siblings and she compared siblings of people with disabilities with um, siblings of people without disabilities. And one of the interesting things that she found was that among the differences, there was a much higher need to achieve among siblings of people with disabilities. And um, where do you, I'll just ask the group, you can unmute, shout it out. Where do you think this pressure came from? Do you think it came from external sources like parents or do you think it was internal? Do you think it was the siblings putting the pressure on themselves? You all internal. can just unmute, shout internal. it out. Internal, internal, internal themselves. I think both. Environmental and internal mm -hmm. by, by default. Internal. Yep. So this is such a smart group. So interestingly, um, what this study found was that among the participants, that pressure really was mostly internal. It was self-inflicted pressure. And Coleman coined this term called um, uh, deficit compensation motivation. So this idea that siblings were motivated by the idea of compensating for or making up for the limitations or deficits of their brothers or sisters. We've heard siblings say this in our sib shops and in our groups. Um, they'll say something like, I felt like I had to be two siblings for one, right? Or, or I, had to, I had to be both siblings as one. Um, so, so interestingly, we, and we do know also from, from working with siblings that that pressure can sometimes certainly be reinforced by external, um, external factors and forces. So, um, that's a huge one. Um, the judgment of peers and maybe embarrassment, right. For some socially unexpected behaviors, um, 
future concerns we'll talk a lot about. Um, Linda, what, what group were you in? Would you like to share what you all talked about? No, I just have a quick question about what you had said about the study. Just was there anything specific about the uh, in the study if the sibling was older or younger than the individual with disability? Did that matter? Not not in that study. And um, you know, the literature is um, not totally inconclusive in terms of when it comes to birth order, but we do know that there are many different um, influences that impact a sibling experience. So like the, um, the culture, right, of the family and expectations of, of parents and extended family and siblings, um, expectations due to birth order, um, are there one or two parents, you know, how is disability regarded and talked about within that family and within that culture and within that community. So, um, so it's, it's more than just birth order that impacts some of these things. Um, so it's not that it's inconclusive, it's just that we have to look at these within specific contexts, and that particular study did not. Somebody's asking for the specific citation for the study. Would you be willing to put that in chat in maybe while we're in our next uh, breakout group? So you yes. have some time to look at and that. And if yeah. not, Lori, I can send it to you after. And you can okay, that'd be great. Sure. That'd be great. And then we can send it out with our follow-up email. Thank great. you, Fran. Let's hear from some other groups what you all talked about. Michelle. So I don't remember what our group number was, but um, we uh, shared two similar to Patricia's. So we, um, our first one was having friends when they feel like they have to always defend them. And um, our second one was identity slash glass children. And I had watched the TED talk where it talked about um, uh, siblings that had children that had um people who had siblings with diagnosis and when we say glass children not because they're fragile but because they have a harder exterior feeling like they're invisible because their sibling with a diagnosis would always get the most attention and um three was self-efficacy uh four was sibling spillover slash whatever is left over that's what they would get and um Five was a sense of feeling not as important, and we slipped in six, which was feeling parentified. Great job, Michelle. Um, yes, I, that I, I'm going to try to find that TED talk and put it into the chat. We've seen that site. We've seen that expression so many times now on social media that siblings feel um, that they are represented as glass children, and it goes back to a 2010 TED talk by Alicia. Maples. She was Alicia Arenas when she did the TED Talk, but I think her last name has changed since. And she talks about, again, like you said, likening um, siblings to glass, not because we're fragile, but because um, she says when parents look at us, they, they look right through us. Um, and so lots of siblings talk about this idea of feeling uh, invisible. Um, let's, I think, Stephanie, you were, you were up next. Uh, we also came up with another one to add that maybe siblings could be jealous of special programs um, or caseworkers or interactions or special experiences that they don't get to do because they're um, not diagnosed or quote unquote normal. So there could be some resentment there. Yeah, resentment is a big one. Resentment is the gift that keeps on giving for siblings. Um, resentment over you know, feeling that their uh, parents' time and attention, a lot of family resources are kind of locked up in that child with a disability, whether it's, like I said, time, uh, attention, financial resources, um, our daily life as a family, you know, our ability to go out into the community, to go on vacation, are all impacted by the needs of the child with a disability or with a diagnosis, that can cause a lot of resentment, right? Especially among children for whom fairness is everything. Think back to your own childhood. Think back to your kids or kids you work with. Fairness is a big deal, right? And so when there's a perception that something isn't fair, even if the child understands it intellectually and siblings are can be really good at compartmentalizing, right? I get that my sibs needs are more than mine, but at the end of the day, I'm still a kid who needs my parents, right? That can be challenging. Megan. 
Um, yeah, so we talked a lot about um, kids feeling like either like they need to be perfect, like we talked about earlier, um, but it that it could also go either way, like they could act out um, because they want attention and even negative attention is better than no attention. Um, we talked about the the shame and the stigma and also the anger and resentment, both, you know, toward the parents, toward the individual with a disability, um, just toward the situation, especially when it may be something they didn't grow up with, like it's a diagnosis or an injury or something that emerges later um, when the family dynamic is kind of already set and that can sort of throw a wrench in the whole the whole family dynamic. Um, and then, yeah, just that that sense of responsibility and fear about, about the future and what's gonna happen when the parents are no longer around or if they're gonna be responsible for the sibling the rest of their lives, um, that can be a big burden. Absolutely. Thank you, Megan. Your group did a great job. And I want to I wanna just highlight um, the, the, the fact that you talked about the future because it's come up in a couple of groups now. And I will tell you that, you know, even young kids are sometimes thinking about the future. And um, when families, when parents don't share information about the disability to start with, and when siblings aren't included in that knowledge about what's happening with their brother or sister, that tends to trickle into a gap in parents really including the sibling um, in planning for the future, right? And that is so, so important. We're gonna talk about that in our, in our tips and strategies for support. Um, but we, you know, we do want to point out that it really is an issue, even among teens, right? There was a, a focus group done at the Nysonger Center at um, Ohio State University a few, number of years ago, a couple of decades ago, actually. And it was this informal set of focus groups with teen siblings. And one of the most interesting findings of these focus groups was that um, the, the, the researchers who are interviewing the, the teen sibs were shocked, really surprised to learn that siblings started to talk about their concerns about the future care of their brothers and sisters, right? This was not really on their radar. And it was kind of one of the surprise findings that even teenagers are thinking about who's going to care for my sibling later in life. We have teenagers in our sib teen group that I told you about earlier. And, you know, some of them are clicking their heels together when it's time to go to college and saying, there's no place like dorm. There's no place like dorm, right? They can't wait to get out of there um, and off to college and independent. And we see those same kids posting, you know, a couple of years later, well, college is great. I love it, but it's really time for me to be thinking about getting back home so I can help out again. Or, you know, we've even had um, siblings post things like, well, I need to find a major that's going to be able to lead to a job that I can get near home and make enough money to support myself and my family and my sibling, right? So these are things that sibs are thinking about. Um, Kennedy, I think you are next. Kennedy and then Danielle. So um, honestly, a lot of the stuff that my group has talked about like was kind of covered already, but um, one other thing that we were talking about was um, just having the ability to like have to explain what their family dynamic looks like and the stigma that follows behind that because like everyone hears you know what your family might look like and there's instantly a stigma um, without them even really like starting to talk about any of that so um, we talked about that and then just like having that responsibility for safety like the you know they have to be responsible and watch out for them and they have this responsibility on them that you know might be a little more than other kids might have on them. Absolutely. Um, it makes me think of uh, a paper that I can share with you all that is on our website. It's called What Siblings Would Like Parents and Service Providers to Know. And one of the first things is, you know, a sibling's right to personal safety. Um, and that can come up a lot in our families if the, the sibling, um, maybe uh, the sibling who has the diagnosis might have some you know, aggressive behaviors or um, aggressive ways of expressing frustrations or communicating feelings that might be challenging, um, that can be, have a real impact on siblings. So absolutely. And the stigma, 
right? A, we're, a lot of us are either parents of a child with a disability or you work with parents of children with disabilities, right? And so you know the isolation that parents can feel when their child is diagnosed, right? Suddenly they're part of this unique club that no one wanted to be really part of, but now that you're here, okay, let's let's stay and check it out. And in a while you realize, you know what, this club isn't so bad. In fact, I've met some great people in this club and look at all the great things we've done together. But initially that can feel really isolating. And the same is true for siblings, right? With this, especially with the stigma around disability and many mental health diagnoses can feel like a very lonely place. So thank you for that. Danielle, did you have your hand up? I did, but I think at this point, all of our um, points that I had um, to discuss were already covered, so we could just continue the conversation. <laughs> all right, well, you'll have another chance to jump in. We'll start with you next time after the next breakout, so just put that put that up on the shelf and make sure <laughs> make sure we take it down. Brenda, last but not least, did you have um, something? You, oh, and Francis, but Brenda first. Um, I think one thing that, <clears throat> that hasn't been talked about, um, someone was saying that um, one of the siblings felt grief, like they didn't get a normal sibling. They didn't get to have a playmate like their best friends had in their sibling. Yeah, grief is a really important one. The same way that parents sometimes grieve, right? The loss of the child they thought they would have. Um, for siblings, it can be very similar. Um, we recently did an adult sibling panel and one of the sibs um, said that she remembered when her brother was born and she was so excited because she always wanted a sibling. And it was when she was about eight and her brother was about four, her brother had cerebral palsy. She said, that was around the time that I realized, yeah, this wasn't gonna be exactly like I thought it was gonna be. And, um, you know, she later talks about the relationship they did eventually build together, but just that, that recognition as a young child, this is not, this is not what I thought I signed up for. So thanks for that. And Francis. I just want to bring up in particular with siblings uh, that are uh, black my, uh, people of color in particular, the safety issues are much more complex to, to deal with with a sibling um, because you don't want to scare a sibling uh in terms of safety issues but there's some very real issues if you're uh, an american indian young woman with disabilities or a young black person um so at least for sibling shops when we ran them uh we actually spend a lot more time helping the non-disabled sibling be able to articulate those safety concerns and protection issues. Absolutely, thank you, Francis. And you know, that's a very real way that when we talk about equity and inclusion, that's a very real way that we have to check ourselves, right? If we are not a person of color, um, working with children of color and siblings of color to recognize that the issues can be um, magnified, right? The safety issue is a huge one because of um, historically the way people of color have been oppressed and mistreated uh, by you know, agencies that are um, designed to protect public safety, right? Ideally and in theory, and how systemic oppression and racism really creates a lot more layers to that onion of safety when it comes to people with disabilities and their families, right? And in terms of maybe not being able to um, rely upon those institutions that are designed to in theory protect us right it's the issues are very very different so that's what i um, mean when we talk about um, making sure that we are welcoming siblings entire selves right and not just the sibling part and and thinking that that means one little narrow thing and one little narrow perspective and experience right no all of our identities especially those that are marginalized impact our experiences in this world sabina no, I was just going to comment that um, Lisa had mentioned in the chat that she was just one of the questions like how does race, ethnicity, ethnicity and culture impact this, particularly if there, and I guess maybe Lisa can comment, but I was just wondering 
the question also posed about the data around that. So when Francis mentioned that, I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. And it will be, you know, if we can expand on that maybe a little bit more, I'm not sure. Lisa, did you want to add anything in response to Sabina before I? Yeah. Um, no, just it was a curiosity. I'm a data minded person um, and advocate using data. So just curious um, how, you know, race, culture and ethnicity would impact some of that data, because we know statistically that families of color, the siblings are have to grow up faster already to begin with and now we're adding in the like having a sibling with a different a different ability so how does that impact the data absolutely and the truth is that to date um, we recognize as a sibling community that most of our research is focused upon white siblings um, for a number of reasons, uh, largely because many of our researchers <laughs> have been white and because the families who step into this space more comfortably have historically been white. And so we recognize a, a tremendous need to gather more research and more data on siblings of color, families of color, and how race intersects with disability to impact um, the experiences of not only the individual with disabilities, but also families. Um, so that is a big um, effort that we are initiating along with the National Sibling Leadership Network, which is a, an, a I sort of call it a sister organization to the, to the Sibling Support Project. Um, they focus largely on working with adult siblings across the country. They have a research branch. They have a wonderful database of sibling research that I can drop into the chat or send to Lori if you're interested in any of the sibling research we talk about today. They have a great, great uh, database of all the major sibling studies over the past 40 years. Um, but we're partnering together to um, really advocate for and take action on more of the data um, and more of the research being inclusive of uh, families of color. So that's definitely an area for growth. So thank you for saying that. Um, all right, I want to jump to my slides for a hot minute because really, um, y'all have talked about, can you all see my slides? Yes? yes. Okay, a blank slide that says unique concerns. I just want to show you how much of these you really talked about um, in your groups. And the one that we didn't really get to that I want to touch upon is that first one, which is the need for information, because so many of you are parents or work with parents. Um, I want to challenge you to think about how a disability impacts an entire family. And I want you to think about the fact that parents really have access to a number of sources of information about their child's disability, right? That parents have access to professionals, doctors, clinicians, social workers, therapists. Um, when you think about it, where do siblings get information about their brother or sister's disability? Just unmute and shout it out. Parents, I think mainly. <laughs> yeah. And parents. Parents. That's if whatever they're lucky, their understanding yeah. is of it. Yes. Yeah. If siblings are lucky, they receive information about the disability from their parents. And we know that all too often, for the best and most loving reasons, this doesn't happen, right? Siblings don't, or parents don't want to burden siblings or worry them or maybe confuse them if we're not sure about a diagnosis. Maybe we're on a long and bumpy road to that diagnosis and we don't know what to say. But I invite you to think about and to ask your parents that you work with to think about what kind of message that sends if you're not sharing that information, right? Um, oftentimes, if, if we are not talking about the disability in our family, it sends a message that the, that is a, a taboo subject, that that is off limits, and then it's not okay to ask questions. And we know that this is one of the biggest ways that the sibling experience parallels the parent's experience is that need for information. Preschool age sibs need to understand that they didn't cause it, they can't catch it. School age children need to understand in their own language, in their own terms, enough about the disability to explain it to themselves, but also to explain it to other kids who might not ask in the nicest of ways, right? Kids can be cruel, especially at this age. 
Even teenagers need information about the future, right? About the future care of their sibling. So this is just one that I want to highlight in addition to all the other ones we talked about. Okay. Um, and guilt, we could spend another hour and a half talking about guilt. I won't do it. I promise I'll respect your time. Um, but the same way that parents can feel guilty, uh, siblings can experience survivor's guilt, guilt over reaching typical milestones, social milestones, um, developmental milestones that their siblings may not, right? A lot of reasons um, to, for siblings to feel guilty. All right, so we're going to go back into our breakouts because it seemed like you had such a lovely time together. You're going to go, I believe, back into the same groups for another 12 minutes. But this time I want to flip the switch and I want you to think about the good things, okay? The silver linings, the opportunities that come with the experience of having a sibling with a disability, right? Many parents tell us, wow, this wasn't plan A, but now that I'm here, I have to admit there have been some hard won silver linings as the experience of a parent of a kid with a disability. I've made my best friends with other parents, right, who are in a similar situation. I've done things like I've testified before public officials about the importance of services and supports for people with disabilities. I never thought I could do that. So I want you to think about those silver linings for siblings. What are those perks? What are those good things? So um, 12 more minutes in your breakouts and then I'll see you back here. Okay, rooms are opening now. Make sure you hit the join button. Hi, this is Angela. Can I just make a comment real fast? You sure can. When you were mentioning about, you know, talking to your uh, siblings about their sibling diagnosis and everything, mm -hmm. um, we, like, at, well, I as a parent built a community around my sons um, about because I had two children with different disabilities. I had one with mental health and autism and, like, neurodiverse disabilities, and then I had a son with medical disabilities. So we had a community of people around us that had children with disabilities, so that way... I mean, I thought, like, by doing that, you know, my typical sons wouldn't feel isolated. You know, they had friends and stuff who also had siblings that didn't have disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with that now, looking back at it and now that they're adults, is that they're terrified to have children of their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they feel like, you know, all they've known is kids with disabilities or kids with life-threatening illnesses or kids with, you know, neurodiverse problems um, or kids with mental health challenges or whatever. So, you know, like I have my 31-year-old and my 27-year-old, like they have challenges like wanting to get into relationships. Like they right. date for a little bit of time, but the idea of getting married or anything like that means having kids. And they're like, nope, not going to happen. Right. So that's the flip side of it. And mm -hmm. if you're too immersed in the disability culture or community, that can also happen. So trying to find that fine line between giving them too much information and giving them not enough information. Right. 
Absolutely. I appreciate that you're saying this, Angela, and I'm glad the recording is still on because um, this is something that is important to cover and we don't have a ton of time in this session. Um, so I'm glad that we're able to cover it while the breakouts are going on, but that really falls under the category of future concerns. Um, and it's a big one that many adult siblings, young adult siblings um, worry about not only finding a partner who's going to sign on to maybe taking care of a person with a disability for the rest of their lives, right? Like maybe taking care of that that sibling as well, you know, along with the brother or sister um, as their right. spouse or partner, but also, you know, the fear of having a child who might have the same disability. Um, and, you know, the great news is that genetic counselors these days have siblings way more on their radar than they ever did. The, the tricky part is right. that, you know, genetics is complicated and, and even genetic testing, you know, sometimes either doesn't give us clear cut answers or, you know, gives us answers that we still need to make decisions around, uh, you know, and that can be that can be challenging. Um, but oh, genetic testing can also provide a lot of relief, you know, to find out, hey, I'm not a carrier of whatever this is. So, yeah, the future issues are real. And um, and I also want to say it's so great that you have built this community around um, your kids with disabilities, the different disabilities, and included their siblings in these communities, and you know, given them really a choice about how how much they want to be involved. And I think that's really the key to you know that fine line is is it how much is too much, right? How much is enough, and how much is too much, and really kind of letting the sibling kind of drive that decision and and letting the sibling know, you know what, this community is always going to be here for you. It's it's really your choice, right? Like it's important that you know it's here, that you know that these are people who are here to support you. And you know that like this validates so much of our existence as a family because there's other families going through similar things. But it's also not your whole world, right? It's not your entire identity. And I think exactly. parents who give their kiddos the space to go out into the world and to do things, you know, to, to find their passions and their interests and, and what they're good at and what they enjoy doing um, as an individual, sort of away from who they are as a sibling, can go a long, long way in helping them figure out who they are and elect to come back and figure out how they can be helpful in the future. Absolutely, and also recognizing that the person with disabilities is an individual and, you know, and, you know, for the parent to recognize that that child, you know, most likely is going to want to have an individual life and want to be as independent as possible with assistance as that person gets older and looking at all the various aspects because so often parents want to make that person dependent on themselves or on their siblings or on whatever and that person doesn't necessarily i mean while well, yes they have disabilities they also are individuals and and have some need or want to be as independent as they can be and so there are there are options as they become adults to be Absolutely. to have assisted independent lifestyles. Absolutely, for sure. And I love the fact that you're a parent sharing this view. Um, because we know all of us as parents, you know, in general, it's sometimes it's challenging to let go and to um, uh, of course we all want to protect our children all the time. And we also understand that in order to help them grow and become independent, we we have to let go and we have to allow them the dignity of risk sometimes. And, and that can be challenging. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I, this is, you know, I've learned a lot of lessons and, the, you know, through my own experience of raising two, you know, unique kids with unique challenges and two typical kids with different, you know, typical challenges. And, and so, you know, fortunately, I'm able to work in a field now that allows, you know, so I work with families that have children with disabilities. And, and that's one of the, the strongest things is having your own identity as a, as a mother or as a father and what are your own goals and passions aside from 
having a child with disabilities because we get so lost in that identity. And then recognizing each child as having their own identity because you know, you do so much become debil- you know, disability focused first versus what are the other strengths that that child has? Are they funny? Do they like chocolate ice cream? Whatever else they are, they're, they're so much more than just a disability. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I don't, Ashley, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, there you are. You're right next to me. Um, how are we doing on time? Or how much longer are we the breakout? About, we're doing well. We have about four minutes left in breakouts. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we actually close the breakouts a little early. because I want to make sure that we have time for um, the last chunk of what we're going to go through. Okay, would you like me to close them now? Yes, please. Okay. Oops, I'm gonna turn my camera back on. Okay. Welcome back folks. Can everyone see my screen? Lori, can you see my screen? I can see you. Yes, okay, great. All right, do we have everyone back? I think some folks are still joining. No, we don't have everyone back yet. They're just okay. coming back now. All right. I closed the rooms a little bit early, so you all can be mad at me. I'm sorry. I, want, I just want to make sure we have a chance to finish out the remainder of our discussion. Um, do we have everyone now? Do we think? Still moving. Yeah, they're still moving. But it's okay. close. Close. I love it. Go right ahead. Close. All right. Okay. So I am curious, I'm actually going to put up the um, unique opportunities that we like to talk about. Um, and I am curious to hear from a couple of folks, which of these came up for your groups? Or did you come up with any ones that may not be here? All right, Megan. Um, yeah, we definitely talked about tolerance and advocacy um, and um, appreciation for, you know, celebrating like the small things, learning really like what's important and what's not, letting things that are maybe not important just kind of roll off your back uh, because you're looking at more of like the big picture. Um, and then we also talked about, um, you know, just empathy for other people and a lot of a lot of siblings of people with disabilities um, go on to be enter like helping professions um, mm -hmm. because of their experience. Um, and then we also talked about creativity and problem solving skills and how you know they have to learn maybe how to explain things differently or how to get around different problems. Um, it really helps helps problem solving skills and helps you come up with creative solutions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Megan. Mm -hmm. Pat, we'll have um, Pat and then Patricia. Thank you. I'll try to be fast. So we had many of the things on the list. We also had curiosity from the various expen um, experiences through various lenses of ages and stages and everything they've been through. Um, being able to share their lived experience. We felt like um, the capacity to do self-care and become self-reliant and um, attentive to the needs of others. But we really thought strongly in the area of resiliency, their, uh, their capacity to be resilient and less likely to shame, blame, or judge others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pat. And Patricia, anything missing? Oh, thank Patricia, you do you for think? recognizing my oh. hands. So yes. what we talked about was a lot that was on the list, but we also talked about being more inclusive of others. If you have uh, a sibling with a disability, um, you are more compassionate. We talked about the advocacy piece, but we talked also about the strength-based uh, 
approach that that they would probably develop because of what their sibling is able to do, what they know that their sibling is able to do. So they're more likely to come from a strength-based approach. And like everybody says, develop empathy, empathy for others and less judgmental. They have to be flexible and of course have a sense of humor because life still happens, right? And you have to laugh sometimes to get through a situation. Uh, so we probably, they would be able to have more of an understanding with these um, phones that siblings have. They can research whatever they need to research if families are being honest with them about what it is. And they would be able to correct misinformation that comes out of somebody else's um, mouth or judgment or something like that. And they're more inclined to go in, like everybody else said, the, the professional field or healthcare to help improve the system for others. Um, they would have yeah. more joy and privilege. Uh, they would see it as, as joy and privilege to have a sibling with a disability because that impacts and changes their perception, how they see the world. Siblings, disabled siblings have a positive approach to how they see the world. And so that can change someone else's perception because they can continuously teach us. Mm -hmm. So that's, Absolutely. that's about thank, it for us. Thank you so much, Patricia. Wanda, I'm just gonna ask you to type yours into the chat because I wanna cover uh, just one more slide before we um, say goodbye for the day. I, I wish I could stay for longer. You guys have been such a great group and our discussions have been really, really excellent. Um, I think there's just so much room to do more, um, but this has been great. Um, the unique opportunities, I think you guys hit upon so many of them. The one I want to highlight is really that tolerance. And um, like so many of you said, you know, that, that acceptance. And, you know, in the sibling world, we say that for siblings, diversity training begins um, 365 days a year before breakfast, right? So mm -hmm. um, siblings are sort of natural born advocates. And um, gosh, I feel like if more people were as tolerant as, as most sibs, we'd live in a much different and a nicer world. Um, I promised you some really simple strategies on how to minimize those concerns that we talked about in the first half of our discussion and to maximize the opportunities that we just identified in our groups. Okay, So these are seven simple strategies um, for parents, for people who work with parents, for anyone who cares about siblings. The first one is to pro provide siblings with age appropriate information. This can be in written format. It can be on a website. If you work for an agency um, that has a website, hopefully you have a page that's really friendly for young readers. Um, also, if you're a professional, we encourage you to make yourself available to siblings, right? We, we encourage parents to say, you know, um, to call your provider and to say, you know, I'm bringing Josh to therapy next week and his little sister, Sarah, she's got some questions about his disability and what kinds of therapies you guys do here at the center. Do you think you could meet with Sarah for like 10 minutes at the end of Josh's session and just answer her questions? The not so great news is that not all providers automatically think to do this and to sort of make themselves available to siblings. But the great news is we have yet to meet one who has refused. <laughs> In fact, most providers um, are very willing to meet with siblings and to say, yeah, of course they have questions. I'm happy to meet with them for 10 minutes. Um, so age appropriate information, super, super important. Um, number two, provide siblings with opportunities to meet other siblings. Yes, we think that SIB shops are a great opportunity to do that. Um, if you're looking for SIB shops in your state, come to our website. You can look at our directory of registered SIB shops and find one near you. If there isn't one near you, we'd love to come and do a training in your community so that you could grow more SIB shops in your state. We would love to do that. Um, but SIB shops aren't the only way for siblings to meet each other. If you work for an agency, for example, and you have a family picnic or a holiday gathering or a fundraiser, why not carve out some time for siblings to get together as part of that event or as part of that initiative, right? Maybe you'll have a sibling team for your buddy walk, or maybe you'll have a sibling cupcake decorating table at the picnic, right? Think about ways you can get siblings together. If you're a parent and you're scheduling a play date for your kiddo with a disability, why not see if there's a sibling, right? another sibling at home that could play with your other kiddo. 
Um, number three, encourage good communication with typically developing children. Um, around here, we love the principle of active listening. And um, if, if you guys don't know this book, I'm just going to show it to you. It's called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. I see some of you nodding your heads. You've read this book. This is a classic. It's been around forever. It's a crash course in active listening. And the basic idea behind active listening is you want to make sure that the child you're, you're talking with feels heard and validated. And if you guys forget everything I've said today, this is the most important thing to remember when dealing with siblings. Siblings want to be heard and validated, okay? Especially when they bring their problems to us. They don't need us to solve their problems. They need us to validate their problems, right? They need us to look them in the eye, make eye contact and nod and, and say, wow, that really does sound challenging. Tell me more about that, right? Tell me, tell me, you know, how does that play out day to day for you, right? You want to ask questions, you want to validate, and you want to encourage siblings to express themselves because most of the time, once they have that validation, they have the answers in here and up here. They just need our validation to really get to that point. Um, so good communication, active listening. Number four, encourage parents to set aside special time with siblings. The beautiful news here is that for all of us busy parents, a little goes a long way with siblings. Think about running errands, right? Maybe going grocery shopping and bringing your, your other kiddo with you. Uh, maybe it's letting that child stay up an extra 20 minutes every night after you put your child with a disability to bed so that they can do a puzzle with you or talk or listen to a, a podcast, whatever it is, just that special time. Um, we had a sibling on a sibling panel recently say, growing up, I was able to, um, go to therapy appointments with my mom and my brother. And while my brother was in therapy, we would hang out in the car and just talk. Number five, learn more about life as a sibling. Come to our website. We have a ton of books. There are films, um, lots of opportunities to learn more about life as a sibling. We do adult sibling panels all the time that really um, illuminate the, the, the lives of siblings. Number six, reassure children by making future plans. We've talked a lot about this today, and I will say that as parents, we all want to be in a position to say, if our typically developing child comes to us and says, mom, dad, when we grow up, I want Peter to live with me. We want to be able to say, you know what, Emily, if that's what Peter wants and if that's what you want, we will support that and um, absolutely make that happen. But if that, if for whatever reason is not what you want and not what Peter wants, then you have to know that we are going to make other plans so that you will have options. And we want you and Peter to be part of those discussions. And then last but not least, remember the single strongest factor affecting a sibling's interpretation of disability is the parent's interpretation of disability. So if we as parents feel that this disability is the greatest tragedy to befall our family, we have every reason to expect that siblings are probably going to feel the same way. But if on the other hand, we say, well, it wasn't plan A, but we are going to meet this situation with as much grace and humor as possible, there's a very good chance that at the end of the day, siblings will follow suit. Some resources for you all in taking your next steps to support the siblings and your families and your communities. Visit our website, siblingsupport.org, to learn more about Sib Shops, our publication, media, other resources. Read and share our paper, What Siblings Would Like Parents and Service Providers to Know. I'll make sure Lori has a copy of that to send to you all. Um, watch this video to meet Anya, an amazing little sibling supported by one of our Sib Shops. Um, watch this video and share it with parents in your community. Um, it's a six minute, very engaging look into the life of a sibling and how sib shops and sibling support can make a world of difference. Um, find a sib shop near you on our website and then consider hosting a sib shop facilitator training in your state um, so that you can help us expand supports for siblings. I want to thank you all. I know we're a little bit over time and I know, Lori, that we're supposed to stick to time and that you have a few more um, slides that you want to get through. Please put any um, questions or comments into the chat. We promise we will get to them, even if we have to do it after this session by email, we will get to your questions and comments. And Lori, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for your loving support in this project and 
and it, it means a lot to me um, to for the sibling support project to be available to so many. So thank you so much. Um, our next session next month will be on Wednesday, June 28th. We're going to be talking about peer support in school mental health. Um, and so there's the registration thing. If you are here, you're registered, but please feel free to share this registration link to anybody else who uh, would like, who you think would be uh, of interest for school mental health. And the next few slides are all about, thank you for joining us. And um, what, again, you'll get a copy of all of this in an email um, shortly, either not today or maybe probably tomorrow, uh, you'll get the email that has the slides and um, any other information that we've come up with um, on this to share with you. And um, next slide. I think this is the access to uh, NTAC so that you have, you know who they all are. Um, next slide is knowing uh, feedback is really important to us. It's how we just make things better going forward. So please um, feel free. It's a short little survey. Love to have your feedback and love to know um, how you feel about this this and other things that we have provided. Next slide. And here's the contact information for NTAC. If you're in any need of request uh, for technical assistance in any way, please take the information off of this slide and, and contact NTAC and they will put you in touch with somebody who will help you um, uh, with whatever it is you're, you're deciding to need. So the next slide is just SAMHSA and their mission and of course, they just want to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness on American communities. So thank you again. Thank you, Emily. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And we'll see you again next month. OK, bye. Right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.